Hypnosis is a phenomenon that takes place at the level of the individual cell. During this process, genes are randomly rearranged, sorted, and parceled out to the gametes. Meiosis, endlessly reshuffling genes, is a main source of variation within a species. But as long as we dwell on the single cell at the microscopic level, it is easy to lose sight of the big picture, namely population. Organic evolution is a large-scale event that happens to populations over long periods of time. A population represents an immense gene pool, an enormous reservoir of genetic variation. One source of this genetic variation is meiosis. Whether critters or turnips, each population carries the rich mix of genes for the next generation. However, this process of heredity does not itself change the gene frequency. We know from the Hardy-Weinberg model that the frequency for a specific allele is fixed according to this formula. Now, if we could observe a flourishing population of critters over generations, and could detect a drop in the proportion of a specific trait, or we'll say hairiness, some agent, internal or external, has tampered with the population. Whenever the Hardy-Weinberg prediction fails, some form of selection may be at work, because the proportion of alleles should remain constant. If a population is trending towards say baldness. What is it about those bald critters that is allowing them to succeed? Darwin provides a lyrical answer. The vigorous, the healthy, the happy survive and multiply. For example, the fleet of foot, by escaping its predator, lives to pass on his attributes, meaning that alleles for fleetness gain a larger constituency in the gene pool. So, organic evolution can be defined as a change in the frequency of various alleles in a population. One key factor that maintains the fixed frequency of alleles in a population is random breeding. But what can disturb the equilibrium of alleles is yet another form of selection, identified by Darwin as sexual selection. If, for example, a member of one sex exhibits a more vigorous courtship than others of the same sex, by drawing more admirers, he donates a greater share of his genes to the gene pool. This rate of success has been popularly termed survival of the fittest. Not a very scientific term and never coined by Darwin. On the surface, it doesn't mean much. Those who are fit survive, and those who survive are fit. This distribution curve of types in a population illustrates that natural selection tends to remove the extreme types. So fitness should not be judged exclusively in terms of superlatives or supremacy. In many populations, natural selection tends to favor the average. Species tend to be very stable, and natural selection fine-tunes populations according to seasonal changes. For example, sometimes favoring those with more hair, and other times favoring those with less hair. In the case of turtles, for example, natural selection seems to have eliminated the extremes and favored the average over a hundred million years. Though much of selection tends to be stabilizing, evolution does take other tacks. If we could watch the distribution curve of a population, we might see natural selection begin to favor one extreme, so that over centuries, the population shifts in one direction. 
Does selection always skew a population in one direction? Not at all. It may act upon a population in such a way that the population splits in two directions. There is a profound implication behind disruptive selection. When a population takes off in two divergent directions, the phenomenon results in speciation, the formation of a new species, which brings us to a definition of sexually reproductive species. Organisms that are capable of interbreeding. Though Darwin tended to differentiate species in terms of their physical attributes, he still must be given credit for recognizing the tug of war between mortality and fertility. The outcome, reproductive success, denies the role of a guiding hand in evolution. Still, there is another theory based on probability that supports Darwin's view by bearing out the stark aimlessness of evolution. Again, we use the Hardy-Weinberg formula as the benchmark. The model predicts genetic equilibrium as long as the population is large enough for the laws of probability to work. Now, if through some geological disruption, a small group is isolated from the prime group, when the isolated group breeds, the gene frequency may change and change rapidly. To simplify matters, let us hypothesize that their sperm and ova contain an equal number of alleles for baldness and hairiness. The law of averages then predicts that the gene proportion should remain 50-50 in the next generation. But statistics in the short run can be downright quirky. Heads might fall 20 times in a row. The same phenomenon might tilt the alleles 60-40 in one generation and further skew the ratio 80-20 in the following generation until one alleal is eventually lost altogether. In a population, the statistical shift is called random genetic drift. Over time, the isolated group may become subtly or radically differentiated. Should circumstances reintroduce the two populations and they are incapable of crossbreeding, the breakaway group would now constitute a new species. The new species may not be more fit than the old stock. It simply comes to occupy a different niche in the world. So far, we have considered only the endless to and fro of what we might loosely call shop-worn genes. Yet, the fossil evidence chronicles a progressive march. One long upward climb from primitive forms to more highly developed organisms. How then does life lift itself up by its own bootstraps? Recycled genes can't pull off that trick. What then is the bootstrap mechanism that injects novelty into the course of evolution? <laughs>